Deuteronomy 31. Why does God allow trouble in Christian lives? Have you ever wondered why God's allowed so much trouble in your life? Have you ever wondered why it doesn't stop? Well, let's see if we can find some answers here tonight before we go to prayer. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 31. Let's begin to read verse 14. Deuteronomy 31, verse 14, beginning to read, we're going to read through verses 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, the days approach that thou must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and pre presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. I will forsake them. I will hide my face from them. They shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they have turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Now look at me, please. This had to be uh, something... Heartbreaking for Moses. Lord's telling him, Moses, your time is up. Call Joshua. Present yourself in my tabernacle. And hear what's going to happen to these that are in your flock. Let me tell you what's going to happen when you're dead and gone. How sad Moses had to be when he heard God say, this people that you're leading, they're going to cheat on me. They're going to be, become spiritual harlots. They're going to grow cold toward me. They're going to turn to idolatry. My anger will have to be kindled against them. I'm going to have to turn from them. They're going to live in trouble after trouble. In fact, trouble will befall them on all sides. In fact, God instructed Moses to write a song. He said, teach it to them so that they'll know what's coming. Let them understand that there's trouble coming to Israel because of a stubbornness that's in their heart. They will say in that day when all the troubles that have been prophesied come upon them and when they're in terrible trouble, they're going to say, in that day they will say, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? They're going to feel that God has forsaken them, in other words. Now, why is it that God allows uh, Christians who love him to go through such trouble, incredible trouble, now, even overcoming Christians have trouble in their lives. You know that. Paul spoke of being troubled on every side. And who could be a more honest, godly man than Paul? Paul the Apostle. Troubled on every side. David, a man after God's own heart, said, I am so troubled that I can't even speak. He said, I can't look up. He was so cast down because of the troubles that have piled up in his life. The Bible said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. But one thing you can be sure of, God's heart is set on delivering his children out of their troubles. Let me read to you just a few promises from the word of God, because the Bible's full of promises that tell us the heart of God, that he does not want you to stay in trouble, that he allows troubles, he permits troubles, he has a reason for it, and we'll learn that tonight but that God does not want to keep you in trouble. He doesn't want to keep you in sorrow. Listen to some of these promises. The Lord will be a refuge for his people in times of trouble. Psalms 9, 9. In time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. He shall set me upon a rock. Another. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. And I, I could take you all through the book of Psalms tonight and show you promise after promise where God says, I will deliver my people out of all their troubles. He's a deliverer. His heart is set on bringing you out. 
No matter what you're going through, I'm telling you, God wants it to pass. God wants to deliver you. He wants you to be free. He doesn't want you to live your whole lifetime in perpetual trouble. And there's a reason why the trouble remains and won't leave many Christian lives. Are you in trouble tonight? Are, are, are you looking at a life, you look around and say, Pastor, that's me. Everywhere I turn, every, it, it just seems that the troubles pile upon trouble and I'm never out of trouble. I'm in trouble all the time. Now, folks, if you're in trouble all the time, you've got to stop and ask. If God is set on delivering me, if he's made all these promises that he's my refuge and he will bring me out of trouble, why is it that I'm not brought out? Why is it that the trouble just keeps going on and on and never stops? These promises here are, are God's promises and they're faithful and God cannot lie. Now, why would God... I'll tell you what, go to Exodus 17. I will show you how God permitted some trouble and the purpose of it. Exodus, the 17th chapter. This could be the reason that you're in such trouble right now. God's teaching you something as he was trying to teach Israel. Exodus 17, just the first seven verses. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched at Rephidim, there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why do you chide with me or argue with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? The people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, what shall I do unto this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go up before the people, take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock, there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did, as in this, did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa, and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel because they tempted the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not look at me please <clears throat> there was no water for the people to drink now folks you've got to understand that God himself directed his people to Rephidim he, he, he brought them to this place where they were either going to trust the Lord or else there is no other place to turn. There's no water. Who in the world, how can you conceive of, of, of probably two to three million people being fed when there's no spring, there's no water, there's no rain, there's not a cloud in the sky, an absolute hopeless, troubled situation. And God allowed it. God permitted it. God had it all arranged. Now, whatever you're going through now, if you are a lover of Jesus, if you love him with all your heart and you are facing a situation of dire trouble and difficulty in your home right now, it could be very clear that God has allowed it. God has permitted it, even led you to this place for a reason. He is trying to extract from you total childlike confidence in his keeping power, his unfailing faithfulness. He brings you to a place where you trust or, or else. You have to trust. He brings you to this place. Now, please keep in mind that all along the resources were locked up. He had, God had a plan. And you can be sure God has a plan to deliver every one of his children. God has a way. He has a plan. And it, it, it has to be very shocking and sad to the heart of God to sit where he does on the crown of glory and, and, and on the circle of the earth and king of the flood and to know that all the resources available and he brings his children into tight places to prove them, to test them. The Bible said he tested them ten times in the wilderness and they failed every one of the tests. God would lead them into one crisis after another, trouble after trouble after trouble. And you know, they finally spent 40 years in nothing but trouble. Because they wouldn't learn their lesson. God just gave them over to their unbelief. And that can happen to Christians. 
God will lead you into one crisis after another, hoping that each crisis will bring you to a place where you rest in Him and trust in Him and give Him faith and give Him confidence. The resources are always there, locked in that rock with a river of living water. But see, there, there was the Scripture says, and there was no water for the people to drink. And the Bible says, He humbled thee there and suffered thee to hunger. In Deuteronomy 8.3, He suffered, in other words, He permitted it. He permitted it. Suffered thee to hunger because He humbled you to bring you to a place of confidence and trust in the Lord in your walk. You know, I asked the Lord when I was uh, considering this uh, word tonight. Why is it that some Christians never have victory? They go from from pit of despair to pit of despair. There's never joy. There's never happiness. There's never rest. They're always in turmoil. There's always something wrong. Nothing is ever right. They come to the house of God and they're so focused on their trouble, they live on prayer requests. I mean, there's nothing wrong with bringing a prayer request here, but they're always looking for a Moses. They have no personal relationship with the Lord. They have no walk of faith at all. There's no faith. There's no confidence. They're going to go to somebody and get a word. They're going to, they need a Moses all the time. Moses, give us water. Give us water. Give us a word. Well, we've got people all the United States running around looking for a word. Some man, some woman, they're just like hungry, thirsty little birds. Give me a word, give me a word. Every word but to God. Every word to, but to the Heavenly Father. Running to people looking for that word. You, you look at this scene and you say, Lord, what's going on here? You know, the water comes, the elders go and they see what happens. Just the elders saw can strike the rock and out of horror, but here comes a rushing stream right out of the rock. I would think that those men would be so excited. Sam, I would think if you'd been there, you're an elder in this church, John, if you'd have been there and you, your pastor hit the rock and water just started gushing, it caused the stream flowing all the way into the camp. And you watch that stream go and you look at that rock. And you remember the screaming multitudes there crying for water. You would think those men would outrun the stream and go into the camp. Believe it or not, it's coming out of a rock. You would think when they saw the water coming and everybody is rushing and they're drinking and, and getting their thirst fulfilled, somebody would look up at the sky and there's not a cloud anywhere. And somebody said, wait a minute, there's no cloud, there's no rain. Where did it come from? You see, we get so focused on our problems when the miracle comes, it's just another thing. We just take it for granted. They took it for granted. They learned nothing. Absolutely nothing was taught to these people. They learned nothing. They're thirsty and, and, and they're crying. They say, we're going to, we're going to die of thirst. Forty long years I was grieved with this generation. I said, it's the people that do err in their heart. They have not known my ways. They have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. You can become so focused on your own needs, so focused on your trouble, that you have no relationship with Jesus. You spend your whole time uh, worrying, fretting, calling people, working angles, questioning God, Lord, why won't you do something about my problem and my need? And you know, God just, it, it, it seems like he just sits there and lets it fester and get worse. And folks, every, every hour that went by, people got thirstier and thirstier and the Lord didn't move. He just sat there. He knew what he was going to do. The resources were there. All he was wanting was a, a people to rise up and say, Moses, we saw the Red Sea open. We've seen God, what he did in the, uh, bringing wrath upon the Egyptian. We saw what happened to Pharaoh's army. We serve the same God, the God who delivered us in the past. There should have been something, some elders, somebody rise up in the camp and spread faith. But there's not a word. 
Here they are. After all of those deliverance and everything God has done, they still are not learning. They're saying, you're here to kill us. And we have that as Christians many times. God, you're out to get me. Or you have failed me, oh God. Why, why, why? And we accuse God of being less loving than our earthly heavenly, our earthly fathers and mothers. We, 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 we attribute to our own parents, those of you good parents, we attribute faithfulness to our own parents, but we won't attribute the same kind of faithfulness to a heavenly father. That's why the Lord said, if you earthly know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father? Are you in, are you in trouble now? Have you stopped to think that God may have allowed this and brought you to this place right now? To teach you to trust Him? To just sit still and see the salvation of the Lord? I want to tell you, I think there was only one or two days the whole time we were thinking and praying about this. There's only one or two days my faith was just a little shaken. But uh, time and time again I would say, God, I believe you. I trust you. You gave us the theater. You can give us that. You, you rest on what God did before. What a miracle. God gave us this theater. This theater is now worth probably 30 million dollars and God gave it to us God gave it to us free and clear and a God who can do that can give us that and a God who can give a theater and give this building do you think he's not big enough and great enough and concerned enough to meet every need you have your financial need your physical need your children whatever it may be These people were dead spiritually. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, the scripture says, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Cursed be the man, God said, the trust in man makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. When God did relieve these people and the water came they absolutely took it for granted the scripture is very clear on this you see God God is trying to produce worshipers and all of his miracles are meant to produce worship thankfulness and worship that's why we all stood and thanked God for that because he rebuked the children of Israel because they had no spirit of thankfulness for what God had already done. There should not be a day when you go to work if you've been delivered from sin and habits and you know you could be dead and facing a devil for an eternity and in a godless hell for an eternity. There should not be a day that you're not utterly thankful to the Lord and every day raising your heart and faith saying Lord thank you and what you've done for me in the past you'll do it for me today you'll do it for me tomorrow our fathers did all drink of the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ that rock never did stop flowing it followed them, the stream followed them all through the wilderness. And you know, it's an amazing thing. You would think that a people who, who, who have filled up all of their water skins and filled up everything they had with water to move when the cloud moved, and they go over mountains and they go over hills and they settle in and, and they say, they're thinking themselves, and this is the mindset of these people. Well, is God going to do it again? Are we going to face the same problem over on the other mountainside? But everywhere they settled, they'd no sooner settle in at night and then in the morning they go out and there's another stream. That stream, how it got over the mountain, I don't know. It went underground and came down the other side, but everywhere they went, that the Bible says that stream followed them everywhere they went. Beloved, if you love Jesus with all your heart, that stream of provision follows you everywhere you go. There is a stream of provision. Hallelujah. God's never removed that stream of provision. Every need, he said he would supply. Every need. Hallelujah. But they were overthrown, and God was not pleased with them. Isn't it amazing? They think they're dying. They think they're going to fail. They think they're going, they're, they're going to just die of thirst, but God's forgotten them. God doesn't hear their cry. And all along the rock is sitting there, 
full of a reservoir of everything they needed. And while you're sitting in your trouble, God has a reservoir waiting with everything you need. Everything you need. That's why I can turn to every one of you converts. Every one of you. And I can tell you, God has everything you need. He has all the power of the Holy Ghost because that river is the Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. I was I, I stopped over uh, at Sarah House and talking to the girls this afternoon. And, and uh, just talking to them from my heart. How when you come to Jesus... You know, you're, you're, there's a battle in our, our spirit, the Bible says, there's a battle inside of us. The flesh fights the spirit, and the spirit fights the flesh. But I'm trying to tell the young ladies that your flesh will always be flesh. Flesh cannot be changed. Flesh will always be flesh. That's why the greatest victory you can win over the devil is when he comes to you and tells you how bad you are. You say, I knew that all the time. Flesh is flesh. You're not telling me anything new. You're not worthy. Well, that's not. I knew that all along. I'll never be worthy. But but you still have old lust that rise up once in a while. Yeah, that's my flesh. My flesh is always flesh. And it's always going to fight the Holy Ghost. But that's why the Bible said, Greater is he that's in you. That's the Holy Ghost than he that is in the world. And I told these girls, the moment you came into, teen, into Sarah House and gave your heart to Jesus, the Holy Ghost stuck a knife in the back of the flesh and started bleeding it. Do you ever see what happens to a bleeding person? That bleeding person loses its life, loses its strength. And when the Holy Ghost comes in you, he puts a knife into your flesh and he bleeds it. And little by little, that flesh is bleeding. It'll still rise up sometimes and fight the Holy Ghost. But as long as you stay close to Jesus and you get your supply of that water that springs out of that rock, that's the Holy Ghost coming out. That flesh is going to get weaker and weaker. The Spirit of God gets stronger and stronger because he's satisfying your thirst. Hallelujah. And that flesh... It still be flesh. Oh, it's there. It's going to be pale. It's going to be weak. At times it'll gather strength again. But the Holy Ghost comes and says it's time to bleed it again. And he'll bleed your flesh. The flesh will always be there. Don't be upset about it. Don't be worried about your flesh. You stay close to Jesus. You stay in the Word of God. You believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. God will give you all the power over every demon spirit, every principality and power of darkness. And he'll give you the power to live. A holy, righteous life. Hallelujah. The devil's already told some of you guys, you know, you stay one week and then you run. The devil trying to tell you, folks, hey, fellow, don't be surprised at those lies. Those lies are going to be a year from now. They're going to be there ten years from now. Those That lying devil is not going to stop lying until Jesus binds him a thousand years and casts him in a pit and throws him the key away. So you don't worry about it, because God has every provision. That rock is flowing. The living Word of God, and energized by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. People going around trying to change their flesh. <laughs> you can't change your flesh. It's called indwelling sin. It's in all of us. But the Holy Ghost comes to give us resources and power and authority. Hallelujah. He takes the Word and brings it to your face and holds it right in front of your eye and says, if you'll accept this and believe it and hold on to it. Hallelujah. Do you believe God's faithful, brothers, to keep you by His power? Yes, He is. Amen. He'll keep you when you stop listening to the lies of the devil. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Never take your deliverance is for granted. Never. <clears throat> I've got to move on quickly now here. The time comes, folks, when even judgment does not move people to God. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. But for this they sin still and believe not in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. Why did God 
send his wrath? And why did God allow them to live out the rest of their days in trouble? Now, these were people of God. These were not heathen. These were God's chosen people. And God saying clearly, I'll read it again. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them, and smote down the chosen men. Chosen men of Israel were smitten. And yet for this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity. That word vanity means emptiness, nothingness. They, were, they, they, had, they had nothing to look forward to. They lived in anxiety. They lived in despair. They lived in hopelessness. And their years were spent in trouble. Trouble. You know, I, I, I figured if, if there were only, uh, if there were 600,000 men that came out of Israel, and uh, there's 40 years, and they all died in the wilderness except uh, Joshua and Caleb, all the, the adults that came out of Egypt died. Can you imagine? He had to be attending at least 40 funerals a day. Can you imagine? Bearing so many thousands and thousands dying like flies. Nothing but trouble and despair and unbelief. And these are God's chosen people. And even when they knew that the wrath of God was upon them, they knew uh, that God started. After a while, they become inured to the wrath of God. Nothing moved them, not even the wrath of God. And then when trouble, when wrath of God came on and God was judging them, they just took it as for just happenstance. Well, it just happens. See, when, when you take your deliverances for granted, you'll take his wrath for granted. Now, you've got to stop and think for the, about that for a minute because that leads to a hardness. This is the reason they were lost. They, they hardened their heart. They, they, they had no faith and unbelief had come into their hearts right now until finally, even under judgment. Folks, I, I've seen over the years people that gossip and slander and I've seen the judgment of God come on them. I've, I've seen people who, who were part of a small group in, in a church that I once pastored. And I, I watched people dying. I watched people who touched God's anointing. I, I, absolute wrath of God, one after another, falling. And the people around them knew that they were next because they were in that circle, totally unmoved, hardened by it. They sin still and believe not for his wondrous works. Stubborn and rebellious, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. All their days were spent in vain. All their years in trouble, the scripture says. When he slew them, they would seek him for a measure. They remembered that God was their rock. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth. And they lied to him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him, neither was, were they steadfast in his covenant. They turned back, they tempted God, they limited the Holy One of Israel. And that's the bottom line. That's the whole key. They limited God. They got hungry for, they wanted meat. And you know what they went around saying? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Oh, yeah, we know he sent water out of a rock. Now, stop and think about that minute. God sent us water out of a rock. <laughs> Can you say, could you have said that? Oh, yes, you could. Because we do. You think, think of the incredulousness of it. that They're going around saying, God gave us water out of a rock. An absolute impossibility. And God did it. And now they're saying, now can God spread a table before us? There's not a person here before I close. There's not one of you sitting here before me tonight. You could almost write a book. Some of you may have a small book, others a large book. Some of you have a dictionary. Your book would be that thick of miracles God did for you, how he delivered you. I just stopped to think of some of the miracles. Uh, I, I, the other day I was talking to somebody about all the miracles. I just started enumerating some of the great things God has done in my lifetime. 
It just overwhelmed me. And isn't it awful? Isn't it a great sin? A terrible sin? Then when we get into the next crisis, to doubt Him. I don't know why God put this on my heart tonight. I don't have the slightest idea why. I didn't know who was going to be here. I didn't know, even if you attend, this is your home church. I didn't know whether you would be here tonight or not. This may be a night that you were absent. But you're here tonight. And God is speaking to you. God wants this next year in 1997, He wants that to be a year of confidence in Him. That God is your deliverer. He's not going to fail you. And no matter what happens, you're going to trust God. Live or die, we are the Lord's. And He's going to be faithful to you. God is not forsaken. God's not forgotten you. He knows where you're at. I, I keep saying, and you hear it from me, He's got your address, He's got your phone number. He knows right where you're at. He's counted every hair on your head. Why wouldn't He know the rest? He said not a sparrow falls without the Father. And you think He's going to clothe the lilies and not you? And me? No, 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 no. Thank God for His faithfulness. He's going to see you through. He's going to see you through. People who have court cases being sued. God's faithful. He will honor those who honor Him. He will honor those who stay faithful and trusting in Him. Let me tell you what God wants more than anything. You can come down here and cry a river of tears. You can cover this altar with your tears. But if you don't have faith, it doesn't mean a thing to God. That's what they're doing in Malachi. They're covering the altar with their tears and being traitors toward their wives. No, God, God says, I want your faith. I, I know people that I have not seen cry since I've known them. They, they hardly ever share a tear, shed a tear. I never hear them uh, call loudly on the Lord, but there's a quiet confidence in God. They live in faith. They, they, they live faith. I asked Gore Roberts once when I was a younger man and he bought a piece of property and he said he was going to build a college and I, I just happened to pass by and he had the plans laid out there and and put a hand on my shoulder he said, David, I'm not different than anybody. He said, if there's any difference, it's this. I believe God. I believe in the impossibilities. I believe God. That was even before he broke ground for his college. It was just a little model. I walked out. He had no money. had nothing. He said, I believe God. I believe in the faithfulness of God. Now, you may not agree with everything that's been done there, but that, that man has always believed God. Always believed God. I've never heard Oral Roberts speak a bad word about anybody in his lifetime. He's probably in his 80s now and retired, but I've never heard an evil word out of that man. And every time I've been near him, all he talks is about the faithfulness of God. He doesn't talk about people. He talks about the faithfulness of God. That's the way we should be, all of us. We speak of the faithfulness of God. Speak to yourself about it. Hallelujah. Folks, this is just a, a little ABCs, just a little bit of uh, a little sandwich, so to speak. But it'll feed your soul if you open up your heart. Let's stand together in His presence. Lord, I believe the Holy Ghost is battling against some unbelief here tonight. Some people, Lord, that are here tonight just a little bit shaky in their confidence. A little shaky in their faith. Because they've not seen God yet answer some prayer they've been praying. Oh God, somebody that's here tonight going through a real battle, unbelief trying to creep in, doubt and fear trying to creep into their spirits. God, save us from that tonight. Deliver us into a realm of confidence and peace and rest in You. Hallelujah. If you're here tonight and say, Pastor David, that's me. I, I need to be delivered from fear and unbelief. The enemy's trying to tell me that it, 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 that, that, that it just seems hopeless. Just... My prayer just doesn't seem to be answered. Or if you're backslidden, you've drifted away from the Lord, this is the night to get it right. Come on down here and let me pray for you. We'll believe the Lord right now. 
there's been an age-old battle or an age-old uh, argument over the years. What is God's part and what is man's part? That's been a question that so few have been able to even understand. But as far as I'm concerned, when the children of Israel were, were thirsty and facing impossible situation, God demanded and expected them to exercise faith. Just to believe. That's it. Your part and my part is to believe that God keeps His Word. He gives the Word first. He doesn't cause you to believe on some uh, fantasy. He gives you His Word. And His Word is eternal. He said, I give you my Word. If you'll, if you'll hang on to that Word, if you will trust that Word, if, you'll, you, if you will give me your confidence based on my promises to you, that's what I expect of you. God said that will release the resources. That releases everything into your life. That releases the power of the Holy Spirit to come to work in your flesh. The Holy Ghost comes and takes residence in this body, becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's to be a temple of faith, a temple of confidence that the Holy Ghost is there, that He'll not leave you, He'll not forsake you. Hallelujah. You know, didn't Jesus say, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you? I, I, I used to think that, you know, if you, if you fail, if you do something, the Holy Ghost, you know, flits away. No, because I came to believe that if Jesus finds it comfortable to live in me, if, the, if Jesus said, I'll never leave you, I'll forsake you. If it's good enough in my heart for Jesus, it's good enough for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not going to run if Jesus is not going to run. Do you understand that? So he's not flitting in and out of your life. He's faithful. He's there. But he has to have your confidence. He has to have childlike faith. The greatest thing you can give him is your faith. The greatest thing right now you can confess. The Bible says confess your sins. The number one sin is unbelief. Unbelief is the root cause of all your other sins and problems. That's the root. Pride and unbelief. And unbelief gives birth to pride. I want you to pray this prayer from your gut right now. Just bow your head and pray it from the innermost part of your being. Dear Jesus, I bring my unbelief, my doubts and my fears, and I surrender them to you now. I've been afraid. I've had questions, and I've been full of fear. Oh, God, forgive my unbelief. I repent of my unbelief. I've been afraid of falling. I've been afraid of so many things. And it's left me in turmoil. Forgive me, Lord. I come as a child. I give you my childlike faith. Cause my faith to grow. Lord, I want to trust you. But you've got to take away my unbelief. Lord, I confess it, and I give it to you. Lord, I believe for forgiveness of my sins, for the power of the Holy Ghost to fight my flesh and resist the flesh, that I can live victorious. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. And the Bible says, the Word says that the good work that you've begun, Holy Spirit, you will finish in us. You're going to go let it be half done. You're not going to leave us half finished. You're going to finish the good work that you have begun. I believe you for that right now. For everybody that's come and everybody in this church that's reaching out in faith, you will finish the work that you have begun in our hearts. You will not leave it half finished, half done. No, you will make it right. God, come by your Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come down now. Inhabit these temples. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Say it right now. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Sanctify it, Jesus. Clean it up. Live in me, Holy Ghost. Work in me. And give me your power through my body and my mind. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah.
Do you know the Holy Spirit's with you? Do you know He's in you? Do you really believe that the Holy Ghost is in you? You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be praying. You wouldn't be talking to Jesus. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit. So don't try to figure out how to pray. Just open your mouth and start loving Jesus, saying hallelujah, and yield to the Holy Ghost. You'll soon find the Holy Ghost start to pray through you in groans and yearnings and love song and saying hallelujah, I praise you, Lord. And it'll start flowing like a river. That rock is still flowing, folks. Let it flow through you in our prayer service tonight. You may return to your seats. But shake hands with three people first and say, I'm free. I am free. I am free in Christ. I am free. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion.